Okay, Tinakota Katoa. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure today for Vonda and myself to describe some of our work, even though it was done several years ago, under sustainable seas, looking at impacts of suspended sediment on benthic animals. Charlotte's already given a little bit of background, but it's important to stress that this work was a, a highly collaborative effort between NIWA and Victoria University of Wellington. And, we're, and Vondra and I are presenting on behalf of a, of a core project team listed on the, on the cover slide. Jenny Beaumont, Neil Barr and Di Tracy from NIWA, Valeria Mobilia, James Bell and Emily McGrath from VUW. And it's great that I see a number of them have been able to, to join us online today. Uh, next slide, please, Vonda. Right, I'm going to start with giving some brief background to the project, and then we'll flick back to, to Vonda, who will describe the, the details of the research itself, the interesting bits, uh, the experimental system that was developed, and the results. And I'll then briefly pop back in towards the end with some general conclusions and some, uh, some thoughts on future application of some of this work. So a brief background. Uh, as most of you know, a large proportion of the seafloor in New Zealand waters is soft sediment. And such sediments can be disturbed by, by storms and or by, by human activities such as seabed dredging, mining, fishing, anything that basically disrupts the, the uh, the natural state of the seabed. These processes, uh, together with land-based runoff, can form clouds or, or plumes that increase the amount of sediment in the water column over a wide area. And whereas the, the nature and extent of direct physical impacts of seabed disturbance are relatively well studied, there are very limited data and a poor understanding of the biological responses to what are known as secondary impacts and these are the, the byproducts of the direct physical disturbance, such as exposure to elevated suspended sediments, which are, are pushed up into the water column. And this is especially the case for fauna from deeper shelf waters and the continental slope. Next, please, Vonda. So what are the, the biological responses that we might see to suspended sediment? Uh, it's known they can affect the, the abundance, diversity and structure of benthic communities. So we see things like direct mortality of animals, we could expect larval survival and recruitment to be affected, feeding rates and the efficiency of, of feeding may be decreased, growth rates may change. But the literature also makes it very clear that species vary quite widely in their ability to, to cope with suspended sediment. There are some that have specific strategies to deal with it, however, and so some of the things that we might expect to be able to, to pick up would be things like the cessation or reduction of respiration or pumping to actually reduce sediment intake. And some sponges do this, for example. Uh, others deal with removing the sediment actively. For example, mucus production in some corals. And it can also be expulsion of large particles to reduce the accumulation of the sediment that is being ingested by an animal. Uh, and you might be familiar with, with uh, coastal bivalves doing this. Uh, Vonda? So those few background slides gave uh, the, the context of both a management implication for suspended sediment and also an act of ecological interest in, in how this how these processes might, might affect animals. And so back in 2016, this project was proposed under the Innovation Fund of Sustainable Seas and became part of the suite of research in the Dynamic Seas Program. This was aligned to the overall Sustainable Seas Challenge objective to enhance the value of New Zealand's marine resources. But doing that while at the same time providing a, a healthy marine environment. So this work fitted into how we might balance um, some sort of impact with the sustainability of, of a resource or some extraction. It would potentially 
input, improve knowledge of impacts, and contribute to the, the challenges work on ecological risk assessment and the development of ecosystem-based models. The work that we'll describe was also part of an initiative to extend sustainable seas research to, to slightly deeper shelf waters looking a little bit more offshore. Next one, please, Vonda. So very quickly, the specific aims were centered around uh, two objectives. Firstly, to try and determine the, the threshold levels of suspended sediments where impacts might become, it's, an, it's a very bland term, ecologically significant. But we were looking at whether we could detect some substantial change in the structure or function of, of an animal faced with sedimentation levels or suspended sediment levels. Could we find a, a way to help identify potential tipping points for a species? That's where we're, we're going with that particular objective. The second one was whether we could um, use some of those, those results and the improved scientific understanding to help managers uh, mitigate or, or manage the, the impacts in a better way. Next, please, Vonda. So having hopefully conveyed the context of why, the where of the study focus was aligned with the challenge region as it was a few years ago, which was primarily the west coast of, the central, New of central New Zealand, from Taranaki down to Tasman, Golden Bays, and through Cook Strait. This was also an area of interest for environmental management with multiple human activities and stresses. Uh, but importantly, this also had the, the prospect of offshore iron sand mining in the South Taranaki Bight. And that was one of the key uh, issues that we were hoping to, to address with this work. The what, which was affected by the by the where. Uh, in terms of the species we sampled, the two that um, are listed here and that uh, Charlotte has, has mentioned, an abundant dog cockle offshore and a species of sponge which is common subtitally as well as extending offshore. And the how is where I now pass over to Devonda to talk about the laboratory side of the project. Vonda, it's all yours. Okay, um, thanks Malcolm and um, kia ora everybody. So the first thing that we wanted to do in this work was to try and establish a system that we could reliably keep sediments in suspension and control concentrations um, for a significant amount of time. So, so Jenny and Neil, who are part of this team, spent a lot of time developing a chamber system. So there's an image of this on the left-hand side. Um, so the basic design was based on something that had been done from some UK researchers about 10 years ago. Um, and it was based on a vortex system and an air uplift, which basically kept the sediments in suspension. So that was successful. Um, we could suspend sediments, we could control the loading um, quite well. We made 16 of these chambers, which gave us basically six little experimental units to play with. Each of them was about 37 litres in volume. Um, importantly, they were flow through, so um, we could get some kind of, we, we could introduce fresh water or fresh seawater in there all the time. Um, we could control the temperature and we can control how much food we gave the animals as well. So this was the, the first iteration of this chamber system and this was what was used for the two experiments that, I'll talk, that we're talking about today. Um, but we're now up to about version three or four. Um, and there's pictures of those on the left-hand side of the screen now. So it's quite a different um, system, gone away from the vortex design, but it's much more reliable in being able to um, maintain concentrations without technical difficulties. We do still have to do quite a lot of checking. So there are manual checks made, um, and this is Valeria making checks just yesterday in the room. Um, to, this tells us what the suspended sediment concentration is and then we can do top-ups and things as necessary. So with our 16 experimental chambers, um, we decided that we would 
um, user gradient design because as Malcolm mentioned earlier, we were interested in trying to be able to identify thresholds where perhaps above a certain suspended sediment concentration, the sponges or the cockles might, um, might not do so well. Um, so along the bottom here, you've got 16 different chambers and along the, uh, the y-axis there are um, suspended sediment concentrations. So we used um, a range from no sediment addition at all to extremely high concentrations of around 820 milligrams per litre. And just to put that into some kind of context, um, this highlight here shows a range from just under 200 to, to the top concentration of 820, which have actually been recorded in uh, response to sediment inputs during major storm events. Okay, so the other thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to, to look at basically the um, exposure time and whether or not that affected responses of animals. So we sampled these animals after one week, three weeks and four weeks of exposure to those suspended sediment concentrations. And then we gave them two weeks in clean water to, to um, have some time to recover. So how we evaluated responses depended on the species. Um, and I should also say that we did these experiments on the different species at different times. So they were done a few months apart. So we, we looked at um, mortality, um, we measured metabolism as in um, respiration rates. We did various measures of, of their condition, so their, their body health. We looked for a, um, evidence of sediment accumulation, both externally and internally. And we also kept an eye out for various stress responses. So the animals were collected in different ways. So the, the dog cockles came from Taranaki at about 40 metres deep and they were collected from Niwa's Kaharoa using a grab sampler. Um, we were initially going to collect Krella, the sponge, from the same place but the constant, the, um, sorry, the abundances were a bit too low so we ended up collecting these from the Wellington south coast where they're a lot more common and this collection was done by Victoria University divers. So when we got the animals back from the field, we put them in the chambers. So on the left hand side, uh, you can see how we've got the dog cockles uh, placed at the bottom of the chambers um, in the same kind of orientation that they would be in the real environment. Um, then on the right hand side, there's some images of the sponges. Um, this is also a, a pretty good way to see the original design that we used as well. Um, and on the top right, you can see really um, high concentrations of suspended sediment. So at that high, those high concentrations, you really couldn't even see what was going on in the chambers. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of slides of um, results now, starting with the dog cockles. So the cockles survived um, really, really well over the six weeks of the experiment. We did get one mortality, but that was just after I think four weeks at the highest suspended sediment concentration. So during the experiment, the cockles were observed expelling sediment. So they were basically just kind of puffing sediment out. And you can see on this image on the left hand side, um, and if I show you, basically that white line shows you where the outline of the shell is. So these guys were puffing sediment out and like creating this um, little volcano where they could presumably feed and respire through. Uh, the image on the right hand sh side shows um, some dissections that we did of gills just to have a look um, and evaluate whether or not they were um, retaining the sediments on their gills and the bottom image is, is an intermediate concentration and you can definitely see little um, little sediment particles as opposed to a pre-exposure cockle which hadn't been exposed to sediment. Um, just, so despite seeing these, um, these effects we didn't actually see any significant effects on respiration in the cockles. They were quite um, variable in their respiration rates. 
So the next one shows um, some images of the sponge. So again, we had high survival. There was only three deaths over the entire experiment and they were in the kind of intermediate um, to low suspended sediment concentrations. The, there was definitely evidence of sediments accumulating internally within the sponges though and that's what these um, images are showing here. So uh, these on the very left you've got a control sponge at day 8 and also day 30. Um, you can't see any sediments within those. Um, and then a range of suspended sediment concentrations after day 8 and day 30. So there was evidence of um, sediment buildup within the sponge from day 8 um, and all the way through to the, the four week time period and also after we had exposed the sponges for two weeks to clean water there was evidence that um, they were expelling those because about a third of the animals didn't have the sediment any longer. So they did have an ability to kind of um, get rid of it. Um, but despite a couple of um, slight negative responses between respiration rates and the suspended sediment concentrations, um, those relationships weren't significantly different if you're looking at statistics. So one thing we did notice though was some morphological changes to the sponge and um, this is an image of one of the colonies and you can see the sediment that's um, that settled out of suspension onto the sponge and you can see these like protrusions um, which we call apical fistules and these were um, significantly more abundant in the higher suspended sediment concentrations. So we, we kind of hypothesize that um, this is possibly one way that Crowler can tolerate um, temporary um, thin suspended sediment um, or sorry sediment deposition on the surface of their sponge. So to conclude um, from these two experiments we didn't get really strong negative effects on either of the species and survival was high as I've already said. Um, both species clearly had mechanisms to get rid of the sediments particularly once the suspended sediment source was removed their respective environments that these and particular animals were collected from may have actually predisposed them to being able to cope with elevated sus suspended sediments, at least over the time frames um, and the conditions that we investigated in these experiments. Um, for example, a question is, you know, how would they cope with more prolonged exposure or perhaps um, pulsed exposure, so repeated <coughs> exposures over time. I, you know, we may have found different effects if we had done gone with that kind of design. Um, we did investigate relatively insensitive measures, like measures that you might expect to show significant responses over a longer period of time, and trying things like gene expression assays might actually be quite informative in figuring out how the sponges or the cockles were actually maintaining function in these environments and they might provide an indication of what longer term effects might be. Um, finally, the, like these were established colonies of, of sponge and adults of cockles and investigating um, responses of recruits or younger individuals is also worth, worth doing as often these younger, um, younger life stages are actually more susceptible. Um, and I think I will just leave it there and I will pass back to Malcolm now. Okay, thank you Vonda. So I'd like to finish off today's presentation with a, a few final slides. Vonda's explained a number of the, the actual research findings which have given, we believe, considerable insight into the resilience of, of two species. Uh, although there are a number of, of qualifications. However, really importantly, going back to the basics, we now have a, a robust and a well-tested laboratory system for maintaining even quite heavy sediment concentrations in suspension for extended periods of time. This, as Vonda's pointed out, was an evolving task and it wasn't nearly as straightforward as we originally thought. It's not just a case of throwing some, some mud in a, in a jar and giving it a stir. <clears throat> 
it's a much more detailed and difficult process to actually make something that is scientifically robust. We've also importantly gained considerable experience in, in how to undertake such experimental work in terms of, of methods to address certain objectives. And importantly, not to regard this as just work in its own right, but to complement other observations and approaches looking at, uh, at how we can better understand human disturbance or sediment disturbance in the, uh, in the marine environment. Next slide, please, Vonda. To illustrate that, it's, I think, useful to just conclude with, with noting that this experience has already been picked up by, by other research projects. The system that Vonda described was recently used in a project by James Williams at NIWA, investigating suspended sediment tolerance of juvenile scallops as input to the Golden Bay ecosystem model to see whether a change in the, in the sediment type would, would affect resuspension and hence uh, the success of, of juvenile settlement and, and growth. And going deeper and referring here to the, to the Robes Endeavour Fund project, our experiments have been carried out by, by NIWA and Victoria University again largely by Valeria Mobilia, the PhD student you've already uh, heard referred to on several occasions and involved with us in the sustainable seas work, to investigate the effects on deep sea sponge and coral species from the Chatham rise. And the system's proving very capable of, of coping with those different, um, those different habitat investigations. And picking up on Vonda's last point, uh, with the experiments which are being undertaken as we, we speak on one of these deep sea coral species, uh, other measures that may be more sensitive are being looked at as well. So for example, this latest series is including microbiome studies as an indicator of, of changes in the health status of the corals, which may be a little bit more, more sensitive and precise in terms of uh, detecting more subtle changes in the health rather than some of the, the coarser measures we've been, we've been looking at. Last slide, please, Vonda. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge the Sustainable Seas Challenge for obviously enabling this research in the first place and to establish a, a solid foundation for, for further work in this line. We'd also like to, uh, to thank the the hidden efforts of sampling teams on, on vessels or shoreside, as well as helping, as well as the people that have helped out over, over time, maintaining the experiments and also providing some of the images used in this presentation. The final note on the bottom of the slide is that the results for the sponge krilla have been published and this paper is available online as it is open access. And with that, I would like to on behalf of Vondra and myself, thank you very much for your attention and uh, would welcome any, any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malcolm and Vonda. That was really fascinating. And I'm going to kickstart this uh, Q&A session with a quick question while everyone else is um, thinking about what they want to ask you. So uh, you mentioned the dog cockles were sampled from the kaharoa. And you also mentioned that the robes work involves species from the Chatham rise. Uh, how deep are you able to sample those animals um, for your experiments out there in the Chatham rise versus Taranaki? Okay, thank you, Charlotte. If I can leap in, in here, Vonda. The dog cockles were sampled at 40 metres. The species from the Chatham rise at 500 metres. So although we can't replicate depth in terms of pressure in the, in the MEMF facility we have here at, um, at Niwa, we, we can at least regulate bottom temperature, current flow, that type of thing. We we treated the animals as carefully as we could in, in capturing them, got them immediately into, into similar conditions which would be maintained back in the laboratory. They were clearly potentially stressed, but we gave them a, a period of several weeks to, to settle. It's not an absolute change, but we wanted to make sure they were at least relatively uh, 
stable before the experiments began. That was really important to to track their the changes through time. Even with the, the deeper species, the, uh, the corals we're working on now, they've been, uh, they've been maintained for over 12 months in the system prior to the, the current collection. And deeper corals still have been maintained for over two years. So it seems that pressure might not be as much of a, of a problem as we might have originally thought. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, that's, that's great. I haven't seen any questions come through on the chat panel. So is there anyone out there who would like to ask a question? Um, if you can pop that question in the chat panel, just type it out, or you can raise your hand and um, unmute yourself, or I can unmute you and you can ask away. See anything coming through? All right, thank you, Savannah. So, a question from Savannah What differences in responses might you expect between the shallow water species and the Chatham Rise species? Presumably for this robes work. Sorry, I think Vondra and I are looking at one another to, to see who might, who might answer this, uh, this question. But if I can maybe just leap in first. To be honest, Savannah, I'm not sure we would expect any fundamental differences in, in the responses. The, the general ecological responses physiologically are probably going to be similar whether the species is a shallow or a or a deep water one. But maybe Vonda can um, leap in here as she's much more experienced with, with the shallow side of, of things than I am. Yes, sorry, I was talking, but I was muted. Um, um, that That's a good question. I, I guess the the general thought is perhaps that, that very deep um, organisms don't experience suspended sediments as often as something that's right near the coast and, and shallow. So potentially they may be more sensitive. Um, but then there's also the, the I, I think it's probably a little bit difficult to just say shallow species will do one thing and deep species will do another because there's, there's definitely differences between populations of the same shallow species depending on where they live. So it's a, a bit complicated. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Uh, all right, next question from Barry. What guided the choice of the species for the dog cockles and the common sponge? Yeah, Barry, thanks for that, that question. It was a case of, of looking at what species might be quite common in terms of uh, habitat formers, such as a, as a sponge ground or as a as a cockle bed, well, the other taxon we looked at were were briar zions. So we wanted to try and get something that was abundant in the area and that could have an ecologically significant role to play in the in the in, in, the, in the system. So that that guided us in the in the first instance. As as Vonda mentioned, we weren't able to actually locate. Uh, Large, large dense, high densities of the sponge offshore. Although we had lots of occurrence records, they didn't actually appear to be quite as as abundant as we had as we thought. So we went we went shallow, but that was the fundamental reason of trying to get a bit of a range of of taxa where there could be a variety of of responses, but also ones that could could be important ecologically in in the functioning of the wider system. Thank you. And next question is from Ash. From these experiments, would you be able to determine K? I actually don't know what that means. 
Ash, are you able to clarify what you mean by K? Yes, referring to the, the carrying capacity of the of the system. Ash, are you there? All right. Um, well, Malcolm or Vonda, are you able to ask that question if it's K means carrying capacity? Um, I would I would say probably not with the data that we have, no. Okay. Okay, next question from Simon. Did you look at the effects of different particle sizes in the sediment clouds? Uh, no, we, we concentrated on um, very fine sands and silts, and, and that decision was based on um, needing to have a, a consistent particle size across um, both experiments, and also based on what kinds of sediments get resuspended in the natural environment. So we had some of those measures from, um, from voyages or um, other things that had been, other measures that had been taken around the coast. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if I can just quickly add to Vonda's response, the work we're, we're doing now from the Chatham Rise, we're, we're returning sediment from the actual site and we've, we're concentrating on the, on the finer, the finer end of the, of the spectrum because the, the heavier particles will settle out much more rapidly and they are less an issue for the, the more dispersed uh, sort of suspended sediment which is going to be primarily the, the finer components of, of the sediment. So we are trying to, uh, to approximate what we think will, will most likely affect the animals over the wider area than, than just the physical disturbance source. Okay, thank you. And the next question we have is from the policy and planning meeting room at Taranaki Regional Council. How did the sediment how did the sediment loads or compositions compare to the predicted sediment loads composition from sand mining activities? Do you want to take that, Malcolm? I, um, I don't know that we, we looked at sand mining predictions specifically. We did at the at the time of designing the experiment and looking at what our system could could cope with. Uh, but one of the issues we've got here is, of course, the sediment loads are, are a gradient. They're going to be high, very close to the source of disturbance, and then they're going to uh, to reduce the further out from that from the centre of the of the source. Just to give you sort of some idea of um, how some of these these estimated sediment loads from human activities compare with the, the range that Fonda talked about. Uh, the, one, the 100 milligrams per, per litre would equate to the sorts of, of, of densities of sediment that were being talked about by, by Chatham Rock Phosphate, for example, on the Chatham Rise. They were a little bit lower than, than some of the, the nearer site um, Trans-Tasman resource estimates that were modelled. But as you go further afield, of course, you always reach that area where a particular density applies. The, the upper extreme that Vonda talked about with shallow storm events is not too dissimilar from what would be experienced in a, a bottom trawling operation close to the disturbance site and the, the disruption caused by trawl doors, where very dense clouds can occur over a very short distance. So, so the question sort of is, is hard to answer, I'm afraid, because it is a gradient and you're going to have this dilution effect as you go further away. But I hope that's, that's helped. Thank you, Malcolm. I hope that helped answer your question, um, policy and planning meeting room.
Uh, next up, we have a question from Laura. For the Crella mortality, why do you think this occurred at the low intermediate sediment loads and not in the higher sediment loads? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so there were, I think I mentioned three mortalities over that time. Um, two of the ones that died were from, so basically we, we actually had to section some of the cor um, sponges at the beginning um, to, to make them all of a similar size and, and pop them in the chambers. And two of the ones that died were from the same kind of original colony. So we're wondering whether or not that may have contributed. There might be, might have been um, something uh, not good about that to begin with. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I'd place too much emphasis on those few mortalities over out of 16 times four of them. Thanks for the question. Yes, thank you, Rhonda, and thank you for asking that, Laura. I have, um, Ash has clarified the earlier question, so I will ask that of you both again. From these experience, experiments, have they given you any insights into what would help you to be able to determine some key species that may be useful as an indicator species for monitoring impacts? Uh, maybe while Vonda's thinking about it as, as well, uh, and that does clarify the the question. Thank you, thank you, Ash. Uh, I think it comes back a little bit to what I was saying earlier that we would the original intention was to look at a at a range of taxa to uh, to get a better understanding of of what characteristics of of species might be affected in different ways. Because we're looking at changes in the structure and the function of a community or a system as a whole, and I think it's 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 not as simple as just hoping we can we can find a magic species that will be that sort of elusive silver bullet indicator species. We have to look at at a range, and before we can really start to do that, we've got to better understand how various taxa are coping in different situations with the responses that we, that we see. So I think ultimately it would it would help us get to that situation, but I don't think it's going to be a simple one. And I think it might take quite a bit of time and a range of experiments on a, on a range of taxa to, to improve that understanding and to get there. Thanks for that, Malcolm, and thank you for clarifying that question, Ash. It's a good one. Uh, next question from Simon. Did you look at the difference between constant concentration, constant concentrations and pulse concentrations of suspended sediments? Uh, no, we didn't in these experiments. These were just constant. Um, but since this time, Valeria, as part of her PhD, has done an experiment where she's looked at pulses um, and then we are just at the moment doing an experiment with the same animal where we're looking at constant so we'll have that constant versus pulsed comparison but um, we are not finished those experiments yet. Thanks Vonda. All right so I haven't had oh another question from Barry just came through. What further research do you have planned um, or e.g. of impacts on juveniles and life cycles and or other species? I think there was a slide on that. If you could elaborate on those. Yeah, we actually don't have anything planned, any additional experiments planned, Barry. Um, yeah, I mean, they would be really great to do. I think personally, I think that getting a whole life cycle understanding of how a stressor affects and a particular species is really crucial to being able to predict how they might respond in the future. Great, thanks Vonda. Malcolm, any comments on that? Uh, not really Charlotte, I just 
agree with um, with Bonda's comment that this this work sort of introduces a whole lot of possibilities that we'd that we could or would like to to follow up, but um, under the existing projects we have on the go at at Niwa and potentially also at the university, uh, basically the funding is, is is a constraint, and we're doing what we can. Okay, thanks. And to add to Barry's question, we have an extension question from Jane. What about the different nutrient loads within the sediment? Yeah, that's a, a good question also. And we did talk originally about um, potentially um, including nutrients in some of these experiments, but we had to keep them simple. I mean, that yeah, that is a good question. And obviously, um, food availability is going to have a big influence on responses of animals also. Of course. Okay, and we have another question from James. So uh, just before I ask James' question, I'm going to do one last call for questions. So if you've got one you really want answered, so now's the time to get it in. Okay, so James' question is, how well do we understand the nature of suspended sediment concentrations which seafloor species are actually being exposed to in situ? Yeah, thanks James. That's a, a very good question because we obviously need to, to understand how realistic the experimental regime is. Uh, the simple answer to your to your question in general around New Zealand is no, we don't understand the nature or the extent very well. Uh, but to provide provide an example from the Robes project of how we're trying to to understand that, uh, we have had uh, sediment traps out for periods of of two years. We've had benthic landers deployed to try and understand both the uh, the short term in terms of weeks and the, the longer monthly interannual variability. So we're trying to understand what that profile looks like, both spatially in terms of height in the water column and different densities, as well as spatially uh, around an area. So where we've got a site that we can, for several years, undertake study, we can start to address that and hence improve the, the experimental side of of the equation to to complement the research, but it's, it's it's an important issue, one that's normally sort of almost overlooked because simply understanding that nature of um, at least the nature and the extent in in reality is a difficult one. I just um, add to that is that there are there have been focus studies on particular estuaries and things like that with or areas like that where um, you know quantifying the suspended sediment loads and stuff has been a, a major focus so there is that data for some places yep yeah, th thanks Vonda. excuse my my deep my deep sea offshore bias Okay, I think we will start to wrap up now. Thank you so much, Malcolm and Vonda, for a great presentation. Um, I'm quite new to sustainable seas, so I didn't know much about this project. And so listening to this presentation now has just, I've been very impressed and I'm very glad that we, sustainable seas could contribute to a wider, you know, a growing pool of knowledge to um, help understand how humans are affecting uh, you know, the, the deep sea, which we don't often get to see when we think about the ocean. Um, Sebastian, I just saw your question came through and I will ask it because we do have a couple of minutes up our sleeves. Um, so this is the last question for today from Sebastian. Did you sterilize the sediment used in the experiments? And if so, how did you mitigate the increased bioavailability of heavy metals Etc. resulting from common methods? Quite a detailed question. Yeah, um, we, we did, we froze the sediment, sieved it, and then we dried it. So we removed all the organics. Um, so we had a, we didn't have any complicating factors there. But no, we did not look at um, metal concentrations or anything like that. <laughs> 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hope that answered your question, Sebastian, and it looks like it did. Okay, so just wrapping up this webinar presentation, I just would like to remind everyone that the recording of this webinar will be available this afternoon online, and you will receive that for, from an email from me later today. Another wee reminder is that in this email you'll receive, uh, there is a survey link to, so you can provide feedback on our webinars. I would love to hear what you think about our series as a whole and also this one. And last but not least, we currently are working on some more webinars in our series. Um, so there are some coming in the pipeline, we just don't have any dates booked yet. If you would like to stay up to date with when these announcements are made, you are more than welcome to sign up to our newsletter and there will be a link to that in that follow up email. Um, and on that note, thank you again, Vonda and Malcolm. Uh, this has been a real pleasure and um, I hope everyone is taking care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Namihi. <laughs>